Hello students and welcome back to Political Science 1513, American Federal Government. As always, I am your instructor, Connor Alford, and in this video we're going to begin to talk about public opinion. We'll discuss what public opinion is, how it is measured and described, what types of information we can and cannot derive from public opinion data, and hopefully by the end of this video you'll have all of the information you need to be an informed consumer of public opinion data so that you can distinguish between the types of conclusions that you can and can't derive from a public opinion poll and so that you can distinguish between good scientific public opinion data and public opinion data that has been gathered through non-scientific and unreliable means. Uh, towards this end, we do have a series of six learning objectives for you to focus on as you begin to take your notes and move through lecture, and those are as follows. Number one, define the term public opinion and explain how it is measured. Number two, describe the characteristics of a scientific opinion survey or public opinion poll. Number three, describe and explain our four key concepts. That's not very helpful, so let me break it down. The four key concepts that you need to have an understanding of are population, sample, inferential statistics, and margin of error. Right? You need to know what these terms mean within the context of public opinion, and you need to be able to understand how to apply them in order to complete assessments and do well in this course. The next learning objective asks for you to explain the importance of representativeness and random sampling, as well as how researchers achieve them. Number five asks for you to distinguish between sampling and non-sampling errors and their sources. You should also be able to identify examples of each of these as that'll be helpful for quiz and examination purposes. And then finally, we've got a sort of master learning objective. You need to be able to interpret the meaning of and assess the equality of public opinion data and public opinion polls. So in other words, you need to know what you can and cannot learn from public opinion data, what sorts of conclusions you can and cannot use to draw from public opinion data, uh, what kinds of problems might undermine the reliability of public opinion data, and how these different types of problems might skew the results of a public opinion survey. Okay, so now that we've covered our learning objectives, let's get started at the very most basic level. We're going to begin by defining public opinion, explaining how it is measured and described, we're going to cover the basic characteristics of a scientific opinion poll, and we're going to cover those core concepts, samples, populations, inferential statistics, and margins of error. To begin with, understand that public opinion might be defined as the aggregate of individual attitudes or beliefs shared by some portion of the population. Now, if you're not familiar, the word aggregate means the collection. So one thing that is critically important for you to understand about public opinion data is that public opinion data provides us with general information about how groups of people tend to feel as a whole, how they tend to feel as a whole. In other words, I want you to understand that public opinion data might be used to learn about how communities, demographics, or certain segments of the population tend to think, but public opinion data cannot be used to make inferences or draw conclusions about particular individuals. So for instance, public opinion data has shown that African Americans tend to favor Democrat candidates for higher political office. But that doesn't mean that every African American individual you meet is going to vote for the Democrat candidate in our next presidential election. In fact, we know that many African Americans will vote for the Republican candidate, and that there are African Americans out there who do reliably support Republicans. Public opinion data tells us that the African American community as a whole tends to lean towards the left in terms of America's partisan politics. But it doesn't tell us anything about a particular person. Public opinion data can give you information about how men or women tend to feel, but it cannot tell you very much about how Bob or Lisa in particular thinks about an issue or behaves on a daily basis. So the bottom line is that public opinion data is all about how collectives, how aggregates, how groups of individuals tend to feel, think, act, or behave. Now public opinion data, and public opinion in general, is really important for the purposes of this class, for understanding American government and politics, for two major reasons. Number one, I want you to understand that public opinion polls are the primary way that our political leaders learn about how people feel during a campaign season when they're deciding what issue positions to take, what topics to address, what problems to tackle, they rely quite heavily on public opinion polls. 
This is especially true at the federal level where there is a greater degree of financial resources available for the administration and organization of these polls, but it does also occur at the state and even the local level. So public opinion polls are a valuable tool for learning about how people tend to feel, think, or behave in the political arena in American politics today. But the second reason that public opinion is so important is that today, public opinion, polls, and data are used not only to gather information about and describe the way that people feel, but to actively shape the way people feel and to alter the way our political leaders think we feel. In other words, today we have individuals within the influence industry who rely on sometimes spurious or very unreliable public opinion data to convince people that they should adopt a certain issue position, support a particular candidate, or join a particular political party. And they also use this information to convince political leaders that their voters support a particular initiative, whether or not that's an accurate statement. So public opinion data and public opinion polls are important first for measuring and learning about or describing the way that the people in our population feel and second for actively shaping political outcomes like who wins in an election where people stand on an issue or how a congressperson votes on a particular piece of legislation now that we've talked a little bit about public opinion and why it is significant in very general terms the next thing I want to do is start to talk about some of the general characteristics that we can use to describe public opinion on a particular issue. So the four characteristics that we're going to focus on are listed in the bullet points at the bottom of the slide, but the first term that you need to be familiar with when it comes to describing public opinion is direction. In the context of public opinion, direction is going to tell you what people or what a person thinks about an issue or topic. So, for example, if you were to ask somebody, do you generally agree or disagree with this political statement, then the direction that you could use to describe their opinions would be either they agree or they disagree. If you ask people to rate themselves on a scale from 0 to 100 based on how liberal they are, well, then the number they report would be the direction of their opinion. If I ask you, do you tend to think of yourself as conservative or liberal, and you said conservative, then the direction of your opinion is conservative. You tend to think conservatively. If I asked you, do you generally support or oppose more liberal abortion laws, and you said, well, I support more liberal abortion laws then the direction of your opinion would be pro-choice. It would be in favor of more liberal abortion laws. So direction tells you what people think or how a group or population feels about an issue overall. Intensity tells you how strongly they feel about the issue. So I might ask you, well, do you generally think of yourself as pro-life or pro-choice as it pertains to the issue of abortion? And you might say, oh, I'm pro-life. But then I could ask you, how strongly do you feel? I'd say, eh, not, not very strongly. You know, I'm probably pro-life, but it's not a big issue to me. I care a lot more about the economy or immigration or the environment. Or you could say, this is my number one issue. The more you care about, the more powerful your opinions are on a particular topic or issue, the greater the intensity of that opinion. And the same issue when we're talking about groups. Some groups feel very, very strongly about some issues that other groups don't tend to care about. Uh, for instance, if we stick with the example of abortion, uh, what we're going to find is that there's not actually a gender gap in whether people identify as pro-life or pro-choice. Women are no more or less likely than men to identify as either pro-life or pro-choice. So the direction of the opinions that men and women hold on that issue are pretty similar. But there is a gap in terms of intensity. Women tend to feel more strongly about that issue than men whether they are pro-life or pro-choice. So pro-life women tend to be more pro-life than pro-life men. And pro-choice women tend to be more strongly pro-choice than pro-choice men. There's a difference in intensity, even though the direction is very similar. Next, we've got salience. Salience is the relative importance of an issue or policy area to the public or to a particular person. So not only how strongly do you feel about this issue, but how much priority do you attach to that issue when you're making decisions about, for instance, who to vote for, or how to behave, or whether to participate in a demonstration? Finally, we've got stability. 
Stability is a characteristic of public opinion data which describes how consistent the direction, intensity, and salience of a person or public's attitude about an issue happens to be over time. So, for instance, if we talk about abortion, we're going to find that there is not a great deal of stability. There is low stability because there's a huge amount of fluctuation from one year to the next in terms of how the general population feels about that issue. In some years, pro-life people have a slight majority, and some years, pro-choice people have a slight majority. But it's not as unstable as it could be, because it's usually a slight majority in one direction or the other, but very rarely is it a massive majority. You can contrast this with things like gay marriage. Not that long ago, it was very common to find people that were strongly opposed to gay marriage. Indeed, that was probably a majority of the American population as late as the early 1990s. But that's changed. Today, the opposite is true. It's an extreme minority of the American population today that says that we should ban gay marriage. So that's a very unstable issue because the way that the public tends to feel about it and how strongly they feel about it, the direction, intensity, and salience of their opinions has varied over time to a great degree. But there are other issues that are very, very stable. So, for instance, uh, Americans tend to generally think that it is important to maintain national security. And we've thought that for basically as long as we've been collecting data on people's opinions with regards to that issue. So that's a very stable issue area in that people's opinions don't seem to fluctuate all that much from year to year, month to month, week to week, or day to day. All right, now we know what public opinion is, and we know how to describe public opinion as well as why public opinion is important for the purposes of this class. The next thing I want to talk about is how we can measure public opinion. Because I can make statements that are informed by public opinion data, which might seem counterintuitive to certain students. For instance, public opinion data has shown that approximately 69% of all American residents believe that we should begin requiring labeling for genetically modified organisms, GMO food products, before they can be sold in grocery stores. But I'm willing to bet that a lot of the people, not necessarily everyone, but a lot of the people who are listening to this lecture right now are American residents. And yet, in spite of that, I'm also willing to bet that none of you were included in the survey. Nobody actually spoke to you or asked you how you felt about that issue before reporting that about 69% of Americans hold this position. So how do we know how different populations feel? How do I know that African Americans tend to lean Democrat, whereas white Americans tend to lean Republican? Well, I can gather this kind of information by administering a public opinion poll or survey. A public opinion poll is a survey of opinions taken by systematically questioning a sample of individuals selected from the population we are interested in learning about. So here's where we begin to discover two of our key concepts. In public opinion, the term population refers to the overall group or public that a surveyor or pollster is interested in learning about or describing. If I say that African Americans lean Democrat, then the group of people that I am interested in describing are African Americans. If I say American residents feel this way on this issue, then the group I'm interested in describing are American residents. That's my population. The problem that we're going to run into when it comes to gathering public opinion data about these types of population is that they're very, very large. And it's not reasonable to expect a surveyor, a researcher, to speak to every single African American or every American resident in the entire country. If we were able to do that, it would no longer be a public opinion survey. It would be a census, and that's different. That's very expensive, cost prohibitive, and in most cases completely impractical, if not flagrantly impossible. So instead, we are going to try to talk to a select subgroup of individuals selected from that population. The select subgroup of individuals chosen to actually receive and respond to a survey or questionnaire for the purpose of making inferences about a population in a public opinion poll is what you refer to as the sample. So a sample is a subset of individuals within the broader population of interest, which is selected to receive and respond to the survey's questionnaire. 
once a researcher has contacted a subgroup, a sample of individuals selected from their population, and they have administered their opinion questionnaire. They gather data, they collect the information provided by those respondents, those individuals in the sample, and they use that information, they use patterns that they identify in the answers that they've received while speaking to their sample of the population to make inferences or draw general conclusions about how the overall population tends to feel or think. What this means then is that public opinion polls or surveys are always going to fall within a category of statistics called inferential statistics. And this is another key concept. Inferential statistics is a branch of statistics that makes inferences about a population based on data drawn from a sample of that population. In other words, because I can't talk to every American resident, I'm going to talk to some American residents. And then I am going to identify patterns in the responses that I get from these individuals who I have spoken to to make inferences about the population as a whole. Those I have and those I have not spoken to taken together. Because public opinion relies on inferential statistics, what we're going to find is that all public opinion polls contain a margin of error. A margin of error is a measure of how precise the estimation or inferences that a public opinion poll makes about its population happen to be. A measure of imprecision. The higher your margin of error, the less precise. The lower your margin of error, the more precise. So, polls are therefore best interpreted as a range of possible values. The margin of error is usually reported as an integer, and the range of possible values is going to be supported or centered on the reported number published when the public opinion polls results are shared with the public. So let me give you an example. Remember that a moment ago, I told you that there was a public opinion poll which indicated that approximately 69% of Americans tend to believe that we should require labeling for GMO food products sold in American grocery stores. But that poll reported that it had a margin of error of 4%. So if 4% is our margin of error, then the actual percent of the American population that supports GMO labeling laws would be anywhere between 65% and 73%. Because remember, the reported integer was 69, but the margin of error is 4%. 69 plus 4% gives us 73. 69 minus 4% gives us 65. So even though they reported 69, what they're really telling you is that somewhere between 65 and 73% of American residents favor this position over the alternatives that we presented to them during the administration of our questionnaire. Therefore, I want you to understand that public opinion polls, again, are best interpreted as a range of potential values. They are approximate, not precise. I cannot tell you exactly what percent of Americans support a position unless I talk to every American. But if I talk to a well-selected sample of Americans, I can tell you approximately what percent of Americans probably hold a certain position. And that's actually a good segue into the next limitation of public opinion polls. They first provide approximate rather than pre precise information. Second, they provide probabilistic rather than deterministic information. In other words, when we're talking about public opinion data, I want you to understand there is no such thing as statistical fact. I cannot say with absolute certainty that 69% of Americans support a particular position. But what I can do is say, based on the best available evidence, the proportion of the American population that probably feels this way on a particular issue is probably about, about 69%. So again, it's not perfectly precise, it's approximate, and it's not absolutely certain. It's an inference. It is an informed guess, an estimation. 
Now, hopefully, we've got some good reason and some solid evidence behind our estimation, but at the end of the day, it is still an estimate, and it is not with absolute certainty that we can say anything about how a population feels unless we're able to somehow go and talk to every individual in that population and know with absolute certainty that every individual we spoke to was honest and forthcoming when they shared their opinions. That said, public opinion polls can be, and in fact are, the best available tool for discerning how general groups within our population tend to feel about various issues. And that's important information if, say, you're a democratically elected representative who needs people to continue voting for you. If you don't know how the people in your district feel about different issues, you don't know how to properly represent them, except to go through a trial by fire and hope that you don't lose your next election. So public opinion data is not perfect, but it can be very, very useful if it is collected properly and in a scientific manner. So one thing that I do want you to understand is that so far we've been describing scientific opinion polls, not push polls, which we'll elaborate on later. But the next thing I want you to understand is that the reliability of the inferences that a researcher makes about his or her population after speaking to a sample of that population can be undermined by various pitfalls or problems. And we're going to focus on two of the major types of problem that a survey researcher needs to be aware of and needs to avoid in order to gather good and reliable scientific public opinion data. The problems that can undermine the reliability of a public opinion's inference about a population pertain to who the researcher asks and how they ask them their questions. Right? Because remember, we measure public opinion poll by administering a questionnaire to a sample of our population. But if we talk to the wrong individuals, if we don't select the correct sample, then they're not going to provide a good basis from which to make inferences about the population. Similarly, if we ask our questions in a really biased or unclear way, then the responses we get aren't going to accurately reflect the opinions of those individuals, so that even if we are talking to the right people, we're not gathering good data from which to make our inferences. So the two major types of problem that can undermine the results of a public opinion poll are sampling problems, which pertain to who you ask, and non-sampling problems, which pertain to how you ask your questions or the questionnaire design. We're going to start by talking about those sampling problems. I do want you to note that sampling problems usually result from delivery mechanisms. The delivery mechanism is the particular technology that you use in order to administer your poll and reach your respondents. And every different technology, every different delivery mechanism has its own fallbacks that you need to be aware of. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I want you to begin thinking about sampling and delivery. So you need to know what a sampling error is. You need to know what types of sampling error a surveyor might need to be prepared for or aware of. You need to understand the sources of these sampling errors. You need to know what random sampling is, why it's important, and how it is achieved. Let's begin by talking about the first type of sampling problem a surveyor might run into. The first type of sampling problem, or problem with the particular group of people that you talk to, is that it might be too small. Depending on the overall size of your population, you may, you may need to talk to more or less people. So for instance, if I want to learn how a class of 50 American government students feel about the format for our next exam, I could reach out to 20 randomly selected students, ask them, hey, would you prefer a multiple choice format exam or an essay exam? And if all 20 of those individuals, those 20 respondents in my sample of my population of 50 students said, hey, let's, let, let's use multiple choice, not essay, I can probably infer with a reasonable degree of certainty that the class as a whole would prefer to have multiple choice exams over essay exams. Okay, so that's an important thing to understand. I recognize a pattern. The first 20 people I talked to, my sample of 20 American government students, all said essay. And what that means is that while it is still technically possible that the remaining 30 students would say that they want an essay exam, it's highly unlikely. 
the fact that the 20 students I did talk to all say, hey, multiple choice beats essay exams, probably means that my class of 50 overall wants a multiple choice exam. Probably. Now, what if, instead of trying to get a good guess at how my 50 students feel about essay format exams, I want to learn how the American population as a whole feels about the issue of gun control. Well, if I only talked to 20 Americans, that sample would be simply too small to make good inferences about the population of this country as a whole. For a nationally representative opinion poll, the general rule of thumb is that you need a sample size of between 1 and 2,000. Generally speaking, the bigger your sample, the better. But if you go above 2,000, there are diminishing returns. So the idea here is that if you go above 2,000, you haven't hurt your results, but you've wasted some money. On the flip side, you don't want to go below 1,000. If you're trying to make an inference about a population that is nat nationally represented, like African Americans, American voters, American men, so on and so forth, you do not want to go below a sample of 1,000. Now, what if you have a sample of 999? Well, going up one probably isn't going to make a huge difference. So do understand that this 1,000 number is based on convention. This is what public opinion poll experts and researchers and political scientists have agreed on as a rule of thumb. So you would like, just to be safe, to get closer to 2,000 than 1,000 if you can. If not, it ain't the end of the world, but it is desirable to maximize the size of your sample. So, the first problem, again, is that your sample is not sufficiently large. How do you fix that? By increasing the number of individuals you talk to, the number of respondents. And remember, a respondent is just a member of your sample, a member of the population you're interested in learning about who you've selected to actually participate in answering the questions on your questionnaire or survey. The next major type of sampling problem you might run into is that you might wind up with a non-representative survey. And there are a few ways that this can happen. One problem that you might encounter is that there are individuals in your sample that are not a part of your population. So for instance, if I wanted to learn how American women feel about a new policy proposing to extend the draft to female citizens between the age of 18 and 27, but I only talk to American men, then I wouldn't have actually learned anything about how American women feel. If I talk to 2,000 American men, I've had a good sample of American dudes, and I've got a good indication of how men feel, but I might not have really learned much about how women feel. If I want to know how my American government students feel about whether we should have a multiple choice or essay format exam, I need to talk to American government students. I shouldn't be talking to any English students in a creative writing class, because English students might tend to feel differently about the format of examinations in their classes than American government students. Next, you need to make sure you're not asking the same person to participate in your survey over and over again. If I had a group of 50 American government students and I asked them multiple choice or essay on the next exam, and I found one student who said, I want an essay format exam, and then I asked that student 30 more times what format of exam, and they said every single time, essay, essay, I told you, essay, then I could claim that I asked 30 times and I got 30 answers all indicating a preference for essay exams. But that wouldn't tell me how the class as a whole feels. That would tell me how this one student feels. So if you administer a survey, it is important to understand that no one respondent should be able to fill out the survey more than once. Because if you do let an individual answer multiple times, then you are biasing your results. You are skewing the results of your survey in favor of that individual. You are inflating his or her voice compared to the voice of other individuals in your sample. Finally, you need to make sure that you have descriptive representation for all of the relevant subgroups within your population. Again, let's say that I want to know how American voters feel about a new proposed law which would require insurance companies to cover hormonal contraception. 
And I went out and I spoke to uh, 1,700 American men and then 300 American women. Well, that's going to tremendously bias my results in favor of men because the vast majority of my sample is made up of men and only a small minority is made up of women. But that's not a good descriptive representation of the population as a whole because remember, a slight majority of the American population is made up of women. Women outnumber men in the general population by a small margin. The bottom line then is that if 50% of your population is male and 50% is female, about 50% of your sample should be male and 50% should be female. If 13% of your population is black, 13% of your sample should also be African American. The issue that we're going to run into is that it is very difficult to get a representative sample. It's not that hard to make sure that you aren't talking to people outside of your population, depending on your delivery mechanism, and it's not that hard in most cases to make sure that one person isn't answering over and over again, but it's very, very difficult to ensure that you don't accidentally over-include rich people as compared to poor people, men as compared to women, women as compared to men, so on and so forth. There are some tools at your disposal as a surveyor that you can use to do so, however. And the most important, the most powerful tool available to us is what we call random sampling. Random sampling is a method of obtaining a representative sample so that you're not over-representing one group or under-representing another. I want you to understand that random sampling is a method of selecting which members of your population will be included in your sample in such a way that every member has an equal probability of inclusion. So for instance, if I wanted to learn how my American government students feel about test format, then I could get a list of every American government student's name, write each name down on a piece of paper, make sure that each piece of paper is the same size, take all of these names, put them in a jar, shake the jar up, and begin drawing names at random. If I did this, then I could be certain that I don't have a systematic bias, which leads me to be systematically more likely to talk to male students than female students. It's quite possible that female students are more likely to like an essay format exam than male students, or vice versa. So I don't want to be systematically more likely to talk to male students than female students, because that wouldn't be fair. I don't want to be systematically more likely to talk to female students than male students because then I wouldn't learn how students in general feel about essay format exams. I would learn how female students feel. So it is important to understand that random sampling is a way to overcome systematic errors or biases, which can lead a researcher to systematically over-include one segment of their population or under-include another. I do want you to understand that random sampling is not perfect, however, because it doesn't address what we call random errors. Let's say that I did take my 50 American government students and I put all of their names in a jar. And then I shook that jar up and I drew 10 names because I wanted a sample of 10 American government students. And I drew 10 names that were all male students. Now this is highly improbable because about half of my class is male, half is, half is female. But it could happen just by sheer chance. It is technically possible that by sheer statistical anomaly, I happen to draw the name of one male student after another until I have 10 dudes and zero women in my sample. That's a random error. It occurred by accident rather than by design. And random errors aren't really fixed by random sampling because they can still occur. But I want you to understand random errors aren't generally a very big problem because they're very easy to fix. If I happened to draw 10 male names from my jar, then I would fix this problem by putting those names back in the jar, shaking it up again, and drawing 10 more, and repeating this process until I wind up with five male students and five female students in my sample. Random errors tend to come out in the wash. So if you repeat your public opinion poll and your methodology over and over again, they correct themselves over time. Maybe the first time I did this I drew 10 male students names, but if I continuously do this eventually I will also draw the names of 10 female students. And so again, 
random errors aren't a big problem. But if I'm not using a jar, if I'm sitting in a traditional classroom and I've got a room full of students, half of them male and half of them female, and I am calling on students just as I eyes happen to meet with theirs, saying, hey, Bob, hey, Joe, hey, Lisa, what format exam would you want? I might have a systematic bias. Because although I can try to be as fair as possible, I might, without realizing it, simply be more comfortable talking to male students than female students, or more likely to call on women than men. And I might not know that I have this innate bias, because sometimes biases are subconscious. So that would be a systematic error. If I am systematically more likely to call on male students than female students simply because I am, without realizing it, more comfortable talking to them, then no matter how many times I repeat this, I'm probably going to over-include men. So random sampling is a way to achieve a representative sample, but it doesn't address random errors. It only resolves systematic errors, and this is okay. One final point that I want to make before we move on. A truly random sample is almost impossible to obtain. It can be done in certain cases, but for the most part, I want you to understand that a truly random representative sample is an ideal rather than a reality. And in public opinion research, our goal is to get as close to that ideal as is practically possible, and then to acknowledge, to publicly, openly, and transparently acknowledge any ways that we might have fallen short and explain, elaborate on, the ways in which these shortcomings might alter, bias, or sway our results in one direction or another. So I do want you to remember that most of the time, sampling biases, systematic errors, and your selection of respondents for a public opinion poll results from your delivery mechanism or the particular technology that you choose to use in selecting which members of the population will actually receive your questionnaire. For instance, the traditional method of administering a public opinion poll or survey is to use what we call a landline telephone survey. Uh, landline telephone surveys use landline telephones. So the way that this works is that Around the 1950s, uh, basically every household in the United States had a landline telephone. It became a household item. Most people, whether rich or poor, male or female, white or black, had a landline telephone in their household. So we could get really close to a random sample of the American population, or at least of Americans with houses, by using random number generators, where we will go to the various telephone companies, pay them a small fee to get a complete list of every telephone number they have registered online, and then punch all of these together into a single database. Then we have like an algorithm, it could be a computer algorithm or it could be manual, that randomly selects one of these numbers. The algorithm dials that number out, and the respondent receives a call. They pick up the phone, and an interviewer says, hey, do you have a moment to answer some questions? And then they begin to ask the questions. And this worked pretty well because if you're randomly dialing phone numbers from a giant database, you don't know who's going to answer. So maybe you are systematically more comfortable talking to women than men, but because you're randomly dialing, you can't consciously or unconsciously engage in behavior that will result in you getting more women. You don't control who answers the phone. Now, I do want you to understand that historically, the use of random number generators and landline telephone surveys was a very effective method of getting very close to a random sample. However, I want you to understand that today, landline telephone surveys are obsolete, that landline telephones are no longer considered an especially reliable method of gathering public opinion data. Why? Well, because technology has changed. Today, not everyone has a landline telephone. And the types of people who do tend to have landline telephones are systematically different than those who don't. For instance, elderly people are substantially more likely to have landline telephones than our young people, who are more likely to rely entirely on a cell phone. And as a result of this, if you're administering your poll by randomly dialing landline telephone numbers, you're going to overrepresent 
the elderly and underrepresent the young. Young folk will not have an equal probability of inclusion in a landline telephone poll because they don't have landline telephones. Similarly, if you are urban, you are more likely to rely entirely on a cell phone than if you are rural. If you are rural, you are more likely to have a landline telephone, simply because cell service probably sucks where you live out in the sticks. So if the researchers gathering public opinion data are using a landline telephone, they're going to get a bunch of elderly rural people. And elderly rural people tend to have very different priorities, attitudes, beliefs, and habits than young urban people. So there are sampling biases that are systematically built into any poll using a landline telephone. Why then should we not simply adapt and also include cell phones? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, there are technological limitations. We don't actually have a complete repository of every cell phone number registered with the company. Number two, it's illegal. Uh, generally speaking, it is not tolerated in the United States of America to place an unsolicited automated call to somebody's cell phone without manual input. In other words, if somebody hasn't signed up for your automated call, you are not allowed to place that automated call to their cell phone the way you could to a landline telephone. Now, people still do this, right? We all get automated calls, but that is technically illegal. It's hard to enforce, but it is illegal. And reputable polling institutions tend to try to gather their information in reputable ways, which means they're going to respect the law. So they're not allowed or able to use cell phones, therefore they have to rely on landline telephones. And again, those sampling biases we just talked about, those systematic errors in sampling that we just talked about, are going to apply. So what are some alternatives to landline telephones now that they are essentially obsolete? Well, recently some people have begun to rely on internet polls, which have some advantages. They're really, really cheap and they're really easy to administer. You can get very large sample sizes through internet polls, and these are all positives if you are a researcher. But I do want you to understand that the internet is not generally considered a good or even a respectable method of polling. It is a bad delivery mechanism, and it's a bad delivery mechanism for a few reasons. First off, I want you to understand that there are a few different types of internet polls. One type of internet poll is an email survey, where you simply email out random email addresses, your questionnaire, asking them to respond to it. The problem with the email approach is that it has a very low response rate. Nobody responds to emails from unknown senders asking them to provide information about themselves. Those things get automatically filtered into spam. So email polls are bad because they don't work. They don't actually gather data since nobody answers them. Uh, alternatively, you might have a static poll that is simply posted on your website or social media page. The problem with these website or social media embedded opinion polls is that they introduce a self-selection bias. In an internet poll that is posted on a website or a social media page, Anyone who accesses that page, that website or that social media page, is given an opportunity to see and therefore respond to the question. But only the people who access that page are going to see the question, which means only those people are going to have an opportunity to answer that question. People who don't frequent that page will have no probability of inclusion and therefore be severely and entirely underrepresented. This becomes a problem when there are systematic differences between the types of people who self-select to access your website or your social media page as compared to the general population. For instance, if you posted your internet poll on the website of Fox News, you're going to get a whole bunch of Fox News viewers who, if you don't know, tend to be quite conservative and Republican. Conversely, maybe you posted your poll on the social media page of MSNBC or CNN. Well, these are very liberal news sources that are favored by liberals and therefore you're going to get a bunch of Democrats. Democrats and Republicans tend to feel very differently about issues. So if your poll is posted on the website of Fox News, you're going to get results that indicate our population is very conservative. If you post it on CNN or MSNBC, your results are going to indicate that our population is very liberal. But this isn't going to be a result of accurately measuring how people really feel, 
instead it's just going to be a self-selection bias. Other issues with internet polls deal with integrity. When we're talking about a public opinion poll administered on the internet, it's very difficult to make sure that all of your respondents are actually a part of your population. If I posted my poll on Fox News trying to figure out who Americans favored in the next presidential election, I would have no way to be sure that everyone who responded to that poll was actually an American voter. There could be felons who are accessing my website and voting. There could be Russians, Chinese, or French citizens who are participating in this poll because it's on the internet and it's the World Wide Web. So I don't know my respondent identity. I don't know that one person isn't refreshing their browser and voting over and over again. And then we've got the digital divide, which is, again, a systematic difference between the types of people who have access to the internet and those who don't. If you are young, if you are urban, if you are wealthy, you are more likely to have access to the internet than if you are old, rural, or poor. Now, I do want to note that the digital divide, divide is not as big of an issue as it used to be, but it's still there, and it still systematically biases results. So for these reasons, the internet is not a good delivery mechanism, and it introduces more sampling biases than it solves. So what are our alternatives? Well, recent research has begun to resort to extreme measures of actually talking to people face to face. So these are what we call personal interview polls where you basically hire a group of surveyors, train them in interview procedures, and you give them a clipboard with all of the questions they're supposed to ask. Then you send them out to find respondents within your population, and they ask them, hey, will you answer these questions? As the respondent answers the questions, the surveyors you've hired mark those down, turn in their results at the end of the day, get their money, and go home. Now the advantage to this is that there's a great deal of integrity. You know exactly who your people are talking to because you're doing it on a face-to-face -face basis. But it's also extremely expensive and time-consuming. And it also, again, has its own systematic sampling biases that it's going to introduce. Remember that a sampling bias, by the way, is the same thing as a sampling error. There are two major types of personal interview poll, and they each come with their own problems. The first is what we call door knocking. Door knocking is when the surveyors you hire, you hire go door to door, knock on the door, wait for someone to answer, and then ask them to respond to the questions on their clipboard. Uh, the issue that you have here is that there are certain types of people who they won't be able to access because those people don't have accessible doors. So for instance, if you're homeless, you don't have a door and you're going to be excluded. But if I'm administering a survey asking people whether you feel your city's doing enough to address the problem faced by homeless citizens, then you might want to make sure you've included homeless persons. Uh, other groups of individuals I might not be able to talk to if I'm door knocking include those who live in gated communities, those who have very large dogs in their yard, those who live in apartment complexes or dormitories. And yet what we're going to find is that if you live on a college dormitory, you might have systematically different views about things like crime and law enforcement than people who don't. If you live in a traditional suburban house, you might feel systematically different about things like overpopulation and city crowding than somebody who lives in an apartment complex that is inaccessible to a surveyor on a door knocking circuit. So another alternative is to simply go to a public gathering place and administer a public gathering place poll where you wait for people in an area where they naturally congregate like a church or a library or a bus station and you talk to individuals as they walk by. The problem here is that depending on what kind of place you choose as your gathering place, you're going to get very different people. I'm in a very different group of people if I choose to administer my poll at church than I would if I administered it at the Choctaw Casino or a local strip club. And so again, I'm not giving everybody an equal probability of inclusion. This is why I told you earlier that a truly random sample is almost impossible to obtain because all delivery mechanisms are going to systematically bias our results. So remember, you're trying to get as close to the ideal as possible, and you need to acknowledge any ways that you fall short, and then discuss how these shortcomings might bias or skew your results. If you're ever reading a public opinion survey that doesn't have this kind of discussion, that doesn't tell you what its delivery mechanism is, what its margin of error was, that's like the communist banner. It's a big red flag, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the poll is unreliable, but it does mean that you should be suspicious, you should question it. However, even if you've avoided sampling problems, in other words, even if you have asked the right people 
you might still get unreliable results. You might still have no good evidence about how your population feels if you haven't designed your survey, your questionnaire, properly. In other words, if you're not asking your questions in a good and scientific manner. So in this next segment of the lecture, we're going to begin talking about non-sampling problems, which generally result from the design or administration of a survey, rather than simply the delivery mechanism. We'll talk about what non-sampling errors are. We'll talk about what types of non-sampling errors a surveyor might be prepared for. We'll discuss the sources of these different types of non-sampling error. And then we're going to talk about the qualities of a well-designed questionnaire. So big picture, questionnaires or surveys are instruments for measuring public opinion. A scientific public opinion poll has a well-designed, has a well-designed survey, a well-designed questionnaire, which is, in other words, a questionnaire designed to elicit responses, which honestly and accurately reflect the opinions of the respondents, the behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs of the respondents, not the interviewer, not the person bankrolling the survey, but the respondent. A scientific opinion poll uses a well-designed questionnaire, and a questionnaire is well-designed when it elicits responses that accurately and honestly reflect the opinions, attitudes, beliefs, and habits of the respondents, not the researchers. However, there is a type of non-scientific public opinion poll called a push poll. A push poll is a public opinion poll which uses a survey or questionnaire that is administered in order to shape rather than to measure public opinion or respondent feedback. A push poll is designed to shape, to alter, to influence rather than measure or describe public opinion or respondent feedback. So for example, I might ask you in a scientific opinion poll, with regards to the issue of abortion, do you generally identify as pro-life or pro-choice? And that's a pretty non-biased way to ask that question. But if I wanted to get a certain set of responses, I could find a way to phrase that question that effectively forces you as a participant, as a respondent, to tell me what I'd like to hear so that I could, for example, take it back to my financer or your congressperson. I might instead ask, do you believe that we should allow people to murder their unborn children? And nobody's going to say, yeah, I'm all for that. Baby murder is great. N nobody's going to do that. On the other hand, I could ask you, with regards to the issue of abortion, do you think that the government should decide what women do with their own bodies? And again, nobody's going to say, yes. No, nobody likes that idea. So what we're going to find then is that if I phrase this question in just the right way, I can get you to tell me what I want to hear. But I haven't actually learned your opinions. I've learned my opinions. I haven't learned how you feel, think, or act. I've learned how I can lead you to pretend to feel, think, or act. I've learned a lot about myself, but I've learned nothing about you. And if I haven't learned anything about my respondents, if I haven't gotten good answers from the participants in my sample, then I don't have an accurate or reliable basis from which to make inferences about my population. So beware of push polls. But how can you distinguish between a push poll on the one hand and a scientific opinion poll on the other hand? Well, in order to do this, you need to begin searching for both sampling and non-sampling problems. We've already talked about the sampling problems. Make sure they've got a representative sample that's sufficiently large, so on and so forth. But the next thing that we need to begin talking about are non-sampling errors. You also need to make sure that the public opinion survey is well designed in a manner that is administered so as not to create non-sampling errors. What are the non-sampling errors that you need to be aware of? Well, the first one is what we call the halo effect. The halo effect is a cognitive bias in which the impressions that a survey respondent has of the surveyor shapes the way he or she answers the questions. In other words, if the surveyed individual, if your respondent knows the answers you would like to hear, that's probably what they're going to tell you. If I wanted to know how American voters were going to cast their ballots in the 2016 presidential election cycle, and I went around interviewing people wearing a mega Make America Great Again hat, then I'm probably going to find that an overwhelming majority of the American population supports Donald Trump. Why? Well, because the halo effect. 
They see that I'm wearing a Make America Great Again hat. They know that I therefore probably support Donald Trump, and based on that, they're going to tell me that they support Donald Trump so that I won't think less of them, so that I won't judge them, or worse, try to argue with them and convince them to change their minds. Conversely, if a surveyor were walking around wearing an I'm with her, go Hillary Clinton shirt and started talking to surveyors, nobody's going to be comfortable telling her that they support Donald Trump because they're going to think that she will judge them, that she'll be angry at them or argue with them. So as for the halo effect, they will tell her that they support Hillary Clinton. And that can be a problem. So when you're reviewing the results of a public opinion poll, one thing that you might ask yourself is, how were these questions administered? Were these face-to-face -face interviews? And if so, were the surveyors dressed appropriately? Were they administering this in a way that could tip their hat and let the respondents know how they feel about an issue? And if the answer is yes, they were doing that, then they probably don't have a good indication of how people really feel. They've got a halo effect. After the halo effect, the next major type of non-sampling problem is a poorly worded question. Uh, I want you to understand that questions are well worded when they are clear rather than confusing, and when they use objective, non-judgmental language rather than loaded or leading language. So I'm going to give you an example, and this is from your reading, you should already be familiar with it, of a very poorly worded question. Does it seem possible or does it seem impossible to you that the Nazi extermination of the Jews might never have happened? When this poll question was administered, was asked on a questionnaire administered by a normally reputable polling institute called the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research, they found that about 44% of Americans harbored doubts about whether the Holocaust had ever happened. And this shocked everybody. But then the poll was re-administered several times using various other wordings for the same question. And when the question was clarified, it turned out that only about 8% of Americans harbor doubts about whether or not the Holocaust happened. See, here's the problem with this original question. It contains a double negative. Does it seem possible or does it seem impossible to you that the Nazi extermination of the Jews might never have happened? Impossible and never conflict with one another flipping the meaning of a yes or a no answer, flipping the meaning of possible and impossible in the answer options offered on that original survey. So are 44% of Americans Holocaust deniers? No, absolutely not. This was a confusing, a poorly worded question that didn't elicit responses which accurately and honestly reflected the actual thoughts, opinions, and attitudes of the respondents. Questions also need to be articulated in a non-biased manner. I've already given you examples of what this looks like. With regards to the issue of abortion, do you typically think of yourself as pro-life or pro-choice? That's a pretty non-judgmental, objective way to ask that question. But if I asked you, do you support baby murder, or do you think that the government should control women, then I've used very loaded and biased language. And that's going to affect the answers that I receive. How you ask a question affects how likely people are to answer that question honestly and in a way that accurately reflects their predispositions. One final point before we move on. Depending on the nature of your question, it may be appropriate to add certain background information. If I ask you how you feel about the issue of abortion, I probably don't need to provide much background information because pretty much everyone listening to this lecture has a pretty good understanding of what abortion is and why it's controversial. But what if I ask you, do you generally approve or disapprove of the way that former President Sigiyaji Nobugadorje ran his country? And your answer options were approve or disapprove. Well, most of you are probably going to check a random box or skip that because you have no idea who Sigiyaji Nobugadorje was or what Sigiyaji Nobugadorje did in his country. By the way, Sigiyaji Nobugadorje was a president of Mongolia, and his name is really fun to say. So I need to provide you with some background information, but it needs to be the appropriate amount and type of background information. If I provide too much background information, you run into what's called respondent fatigue. If you have to read an essay full of historical facts about Sigiyaji Nobugadorje before you get to the question, you're probably not going to do so. You're going to get bored, you're going to check a random box, or you're going to skip 
the question. Alternatively, if I don't provide you with any information, then again, you're just going to guess. You're going to say, oh, I don't know, this, this, this name sounds like really smug, I don't like that. Or this, this name is really fun to say, I do like that. So you're just going to check around the box. Either way, I haven't learned how you felt. Conversely, I don't want to lead you, right? So when I'm providing background information in wording my question, that needs to be objective and non-judgmental, just like the question itself. Because if I only provided you with the negative information about everything that Sigi Adin Abgadorje did poorly, I would probably find that everybody hates him. But if I only ever told you about the things he did well, then of course you're going to tell me at the end of this question that you think he did a good job. Because all you know about this individual are his successes. You haven't learned anything about his failures. So if I want to know how you really feel about Sigi Adin Abgadorje, I need to provide good and unbiased background information, and I need to make sure that it is the appropriate amount of background information. How much background information is appropriate? Depends on the topic, depends on your audience. If you're talking to a bunch of graduate students, then you could probably afford to have some heavier reading. But if you're talking to the general population, keep it light, because people be lazy. All right, after we have made certain to avoid the halo effect and to have properly worded questions, the next thing we need to worry about is the order of our questions. And the reason you need to be aware of the ordering of your questions on the questionnaire is something that we call the anchoring effect. The anchoring effect is when the topic of one question becomes the central focus that a respondent thinks about while formulating answers to subsequent questions. So, for instance, if I were to ask you, do you believe that young people respond to some authority in their life? or to a challenge, and then I were to ask you, do you support the draft, you're more likely to say yes to support the draft because what you're thinking about while formulating your answer to the draft question is the topic introduced by the preceding question. Do you believe that young people respond positively to some authority and challenge in their life? If you're not entirely certain how this works, uh, there is a video in the optional coursework content for this week called Leading the Prime Minister that will provide you an example of how improperly ordered questions can lead people to provide a certain set of answers that don't accurately reflect their own opinions, but rather reflect the responses that a surveyor would like to receive. So how do you avoid a poorly ordered set of questions? Well, you need to make sure that the content of the questions are presented in ways that do not tip your hat. People don't need to know what you're getting at, and you need to make sure that if you have a question that is controversial or that might agitate or get an emotional response out of your survey respondents, that appears at the end rather than the beginning of your survey. If I ask you a question that makes you really angry first, and then I ask you a whole bunch of mundane questions, the fact that you're angry is probably going to mean that you provide more negative responses to every other question. Uh, I need to make sure that related questions are separated. So maybe I do want to know how you feel about whether young people respond to a challenge, but I also want to know how you feel about the draft. And I don't want the anchoring effect to cause your considerations about whether young people respond to a challenge to flavor your response to the draft question. What I'm going to do is I'm going to space those out. I might ask you the draft question at the very beginning, and then the question about whether young people respond to a challenge at the very end of my survey. And maybe those are the only two questions that I'm really interested in learning about. In that case, I'm going to separate them with a bunch of dead questions. So I might ask you, do you support the draft? But then I might ask you next, what's your favorite breakfast cereal? How many times do you eat in an average day? And then at the very end, after a bunch of dead questions that I don't really care about, I'll ask you, do young people respond to a challenge? And you can tell me your answer there. So make sure that your questions are ordered in such a way that each one is answered independently. Make sure that your questions are ordered in such a way that the topic of one question doesn't influence the respondent's answer when addressing any other question. Of course, it is also important to understand that most public opinion polls are going to be multiple choice. And the reason that they're multiple choice, meaning that you are given a question and then a preset number of answer options to choose from, is that if you leave them open-ended, it's very hard to process people's feedback. Because you're going to get some really long essays. And sometimes the responses that people give aren't actually going to directly or clearly respond to the question you've asked. Some people get very distracted. So 
That means that nine times out of 10, if you're administering a survey, it needs to be multiple choice. You need to give your respondents a limited number of particular answer options that they can choose from so that you're able to process this information quickly and efficiently and so that you can make sure that they actually answer the question, which they might not do if it's open-ended. However, the fact that the answer options must be pre-generated for your respondents can also be problematic. Because if you're not careful with the answer options you make available, again, you're going to introduce some non-sampling errors that result in unreliable answers which don't provide information about how the respondents feel. Generally speaking, your answer options on any question should satisfy four conditions. First, they need to be mutually exclusive. They don't overlap. Second, they need to be clear. Third, they need to be unbiased. And finally, they need to be exhaustive. So, for instance, let's look at that first question. Do you approve or disapprove of the way that President Sidi Ajin el ran his country? Again, this is a former president of Mongolia, and you don't really know anything about it. The correct answer to this question for most of you is probably going to be, I don't know, or I don't really have an opinion on the dude, because I've never heard of him. Well, if... I asked you this question, do you approve or disapprove of Sigi Adin of the And I forced you to choose between either approve or disapprove. There is no correct answer option for you. These are not exhaustive, because it is quite possible that there is another answer option that would be correct for a particular respondent. I don't know, or I have no opinion. So I could improve this question and answer option set by adding in a third option for my respondents to indicate that they don't have an opinion or they're not sure how they feel. Next, your answer options need to be clear and they need to be unbiased, just like your questions. An example, and this is a real world example, of biased answer options is provided by the website MSNBC in 2016. When MSNBC administered a public opinion poll asking the people who access their website, should Donald Trump release his tax returns? Now, there may be some issues with that question in and of itself, but the big problem doesn't really emerge until you start looking at the answer options. Because the answer options that were made available to respondents on the survey were, yes, the American people have a right to know, or no, the American people should be kept in the dark. You can probably guess what answer the designers of this poll were hoping to receive. They want you to say yes. Remember the halo effect. That means you're probably going to say yes because you're not comfortable saying the American people should be kept in the dark. Maybe you didn't believe that Donald Trump should release his tax returns. Maybe you were one of those people who said, look, this is his private finances. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether he's qualified as a president. No, he shouldn't give in to the bullying. He should keep them to himself. Maybe you're not. I'm not really going to find out from this answer, option set in this question, because I won't know if you said yes, because you actually believe that, yeah, Donald Trump should have made his tax records public knowledge, or because you were uncomfortable saying the American people should be kept in the dark. So make sure that your answer options aren't confusing, but also make sure that they are unbiased, that they are objective and non-judgmental. Finally, make sure that your answer options are going to be mutually exclusive or non-overlapping. Imagine that I asked you, how many times do you eat on an average day? And your answer options were one to two, two to three, or three to four. Let's say that you eat exactly two times a day. Well, there are two answer options that you could choose between, one to two, or two to three. Since both of these answer options contain the number two, you don't know which one is most appropriate for you. And as a result, you as a respondent might feel confused and simply skip the question or check a random box. Either way, once again, I haven't learned how you feel. So remember, in order to avoid biasing errors in your answer options. Your answer options need to be, number one, exhaustive, meaning that there is a correct answer available for literally any respondent. Number two, mutually exclusive, meaning they don't overlap. Number three, clear rather than confusing. And number four, unbiased and objective rather than leading. The bottom line is that a public opinion poll can provide some good probabilistic data indicating how groups of people tend to feel on a certain issue or how they tend to behave or think in a certain area. But only if they are well designed.
so as to avoid sampling errors, meaning that you've spoken to the right people using a random method of selection, using random sampling to ensure that every member of your population has an equal probability of inclusion, your sample is sufficiently large, and it is descriptively representative. And those surveys also need to be asked in the proper way, meaning that you have a well-designed survey. Remember that a well-designed survey is any survey that prompts honest answers which accurately reflect the attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, or opinions of the respondents, and not those of the researchers, surveyors, or financial backers. The questions, therefore, need to be ordered and worded properly, and you need to be very careful in your answer options. If you have any questions about how to interpret the results of a public opinion poll, or distinguish between a push poll and a scientific opinion poll, I will point you towards the handout available in this week's course folder, everything you need to be an informed consumer of public opinion data. If you've read that and you still have questions, work your way through the rest of the content in this week's coursework folder, and then return.